Hi, today's episode is the first episode in a series on D3. D3 is such an interesting subject, and with a massive increase in data artist and engineer roles, I think it's worth going pretty deep on it. So, knowing that we're going to be doing quite a lot of D3 coding, I decided that the first episode will be about setting up an optimal environment with Gulp, Bar, SAS, and D3. Oh, and Tracer. Because who wants to type function over and over again? At the end of this episode, you will have an environment that transpiles ES6 code, compiles CSS from SAS, and auto reloads when any of your files are updated. So let's do it! Our work starts in the terminal. We start off by creating an empty folder and seeding into it. I'm calling mine D3Cast, but it may be called anything you want. We want to install some npm modules and persist the configuration. So we call npm init to create the package file. We just say yes to all the prompts. Ok, so let's install our npm packages. For our environment, we need gulp, gulp connect, gulp traceur, and gulp ruby sass. Gulp ruby sass relies on the sass gem being installed. It's a bit of a ball egg, but I've got it installed already and had issues with the native node SAS module when I tried to install it. We're not going to use Browserify for this episode, and we want to pull in client-side libraries, so let's use Bower to install D3. Cool. We're done on the terminal side for now, so let's open this folder up in our text editor. First we're going to create the shell of our environment, then we'll color in the details. We're going to rely on gulp quite heavily, so we create our gulp file first before we do anything else. Now we create folders for our ES6 scripts and SAS files. Our scripts folder and our SAS folder. In our scripts folder we create a file called app.js and in the SAS folder a file called main.scss. In the root we create a file called index.html and we copy our basic structure in here. I'm pretty sure you don't want to be looking at me coding up an HTML document. What's interesting in the HTML is that we are referencing our CSS and script files from a dist folder. Remember that, because we're going to set up our gulp file to compile the SAS and the ES6 to that folder. Here we go. In our gulp file, we require all the necessary stuff. Gulp, connect, which we use for hosting a server with auto reload, traceur, our ES6 transpiler, and gulp ruby sass, which we use to compile our sass to CSS. Let's increase the font size a bit. That's better. We start by setting up a task for hosting our web server with auto reload. We call this task connect and give it a function. In the function, we call the server method on connect with the live reload option set to true. And for our port, we've decided on 8005. Sweet, let's define our default task now. Instead of giving it a task function, we give it an array of other tasks that it should execute. For the moment, we only call the connect function. Back in terminal, we execute the gulp command. And when we hit the correct port on localhost, we see that it loaded our HTML file. So we still need to hook in our SAS compilation, ES6 transpilation, and auto reload based on changes to our files. Next up is SAS compilation. We create a task called SAS and pass it a task function. In here, we use the source command, specifying a glob that matches any SCSS files in our SAS folder. We then pipe the resulting stream to the SAS module we required earlier. And then pipe the compiled result to our dist folder using the gulp dist command. We also want to hook the sass command into the default task here at the bottom. 
If we leave it like this, it would mean that the SAS compilation only happens when gob starts up and executes the default task. We wanted to compile the SAS files to CSS as soon as it detects a change to any of our SAS files. To do that, we create a new task called watch. And in here, we call the gulp watch command with a glob to our SAS files. And we tell it to execute the SAS task when any of these files change. And, like the other tasks, we start the watch task from our default task here at the bottom. To test the setup, we make a change to our SAS file. I'm just setting the default font family to Helvetica, falling back to Arial for Windows machines. And also specifying a color for circles. When I save that file, you can see that it automatically compiles to our CSS file. Next up, we need to do the same for our ES6 files, transpiling them with Tracere as they change. So we create a new task called Tracere, and in here we specify a glob pointing to our ES6 source files. We pipe that to the Tracere module, and pipe the result to the dist folder, exactly like we did in the SAS task. We also want to kick off this task automatically, as files are changed. So we set it up in the watch task like this. Updating the glob and updating the target task. I made a typo over there. I need to fix the glob quickly. To test this, we create an ES6 arrow function in the app.js file. When I save that, you can see that it transpiled correctly. One last thing. And this is kind of important, we want our web page to reload as soon as we make changes to any of the important files, in our case our JS files and CSS files. For this we define a reload task and in here specify a glob that includes our transpiled JS files and our compiled CSS files. We pipe this to the connect modules reload method, telling it to issue a reload instruction to the browser for these files. We want this to execute automatically, don't we? Otherwise, what's the point? So we hook this up in our watch task, specifying the same glob again. Let's take advantage of the auto reload and position the text editor right next to the browser like this. When I clear out the contents of our ES6 app.js file and save that, you see that the browser reloads. Let's start by defining some D3 stuff, shall we? Lots of D3 examples and tutorials follow this pattern, defining a draw function that takes data. We do the same, although we won't be using it correctly in this episode as of yet. And we hook up a call to the draw function. We just don't specify any data for now. Let's do something really simple with D3 to validate our environment. We select the main SVG element by ID. We've got this element already defined in our HTML. To this, we append a circle. Its horizontal position is 50. Same with the vertical position. And we also give it a radius of 50. Let's save that and... Sweet! It's already rendered in the browser. Our environment works. Missed that? Ok, let's do it again. We duplicate this circle and move it on along the x-axis. There! Let's also play around with our SAS file. I change the full color for our circles to a tag tree green and save that. Sweet! That's it for this episode. Man, I look forward to using this powerful environment in our upcoming episodes to really go deep on D3JS. See you next time!